Okay, so uh, one thing that I wanted to clarify from the previous uh, segment, um, in the double-blind cancer drug clinical trial, uh, the independent variable, which is the, the one difference in how I'm treating the two groups of patients, the independent variable would be the cancer drug, the treatment. Uh, and the dependent variable, remember that's the thing that I'm measuring, in this case would be the size of the, the tumors, or hopefully the uh, shrinking of the tumor size in the experimental group. So the independent variable is the thing that I control. I'm, I'm manipulating the fact that some patients are receiving the drug and some are, are not. That's what I am controlling if I design the experiment. So remember, uh, independent starts with an I. I control the independent variable. The dependent variable is what I measure. Now, all of these terms that relate to the scientific method are, I've got them on a document with definitions and examples, and I will post that on Google Classroom so that you can use it to study. Uh, make sure that you know the six steps of the scientific method that we discussed earlier. Make sure you can list those in the correct order. And then make sure you know the terms, independent variable, dependent variable, experimental group, control group, um, uh, constants uh, was, was the other term that we talked about. So I want to shift gears a little bit here uh, and talk about another important topic, which is the characteristics of all living organisms uh, on Earth. And so if, if you look at this image here, you see a representation of the immense diversity of life on Earth, from bacteria and single-celled organisms to plants, fungi, and of course the immense diversity in the animal kingdom. And you think about how different life can be, how diverse uh, life is on earth. Um, but it's also important to realize that there are some, some basic characteristics that tie all of these organisms together, things that they share in common. So this is maybe a silly way to think of it, but I think an effective way. You may not think you have much in common with a bacterium or a mushroom or an oak tree or an earthworm and I'm just picking those at random. Uh, you may not think you have much in common with those organisms, but actually you and they, all living organisms, share the following characteristics. And I've come up with nine of these. Different textbooks will list it differently. Uh, you may see a list of seven, you may see 10, but I, I, I came up with these nine basic characteristics that I wanted you to know and that you need to know in order to understand uh, the things that we discuss in this course. So these are the nine characteristics that all living organisms share in common. And the first one, I guess, is pretty obvious that all living things are made up of cells, either one cell or many. Um, every living organism on planet Earth is either unicellular or multicellular. Bacteria, protists, these are organisms. The entire organism is one cell. Uh, multi multicellular, of course, means made up of many cells, and that would include us. Uh, you have some something on the order of 30 trillion cells in your body. Animals, plants, fungi, at least most fungi, are multicellular. Secondly, all living things can reproduce. And there's basically two strategies for reproduction uh, in the living world. Some species reproduce exclusively asexually. Now, when you put the letter A in front of a word, uh, that means not, right? So not sexually. Asexually means there's one single parent and the offspring are clones of that parent. They are genetically identical to the parent. Um, Single-celled organisms reproduce this way almost exclusively, and sometimes plants reproduce asexually, although uh, many people are surprised. Uh, I'll come back to that image in just a moment. Many people are surprised to learn that plants 
uh, do have sex. <laughs> plants do reproduce sexually. So uh, some species of plants um, can reproduce both asexually and sexually. I want to back up to this image that I skipped over. This is a really, I think, a fascinating example of asexual reproduction in the plant kingdom. What you're looking at is a forest of aspen trees out in Colorado somewhere. And uh, researchers have done studies where they, they went to a forest like this and they collected DNA samples from the tissue of many of these aspen trees throughout the forest, you know, hundreds of them. And when they analyzed the DNA, they discovered it was, it was not just similar. Uh, it wasn't just that they were all the same species of tree, but in fact, uh, the DNA was absolutely identical. And what happens is a single aspen tree will spread out its roots underground and each of those roots will sprout a new tree. And then that tree will spread out its roots and grow a new tree and a new tree and a new tree. And so it's, it's cloning. It's a natural form of cloning. Uh, and that's asexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction, of course, is where you have two parents um, and they are combining their DNAs together. So a sperm and egg, uh, the, the, in science, in, in, in biology, we refer to sperm and egg as gametes. These are specialized reproductive cells. So a sperm from the father, an egg from the mother combine uh, to produce uh, an offspring. And uh, this is how most plants reproduce. Even those aspen trees that I mentioned before, they, are, they do sometimes reproduce sexually. Um, they, they can do it either way. Uh, animals reproduce sexually, of course. And, and the, the advantage biologically is that a species that reproduces sexually is going to have much more genetic diversity. Whereas if it's an asexual species like, like this paramecium, when, when this thing divides, you're going to have two genetically identical paramecia. So if one of them has a genetic flaw that makes it susceptible to disease or, or something like that, then they both have that same flaw. And all of their offspring will have that same flaw. And so there's, there's no genetic diversity. That's the disadvantage to uh, asexual reproduction. Uh, and so I, I mentioned earlier uh, that plants have sex and students are often puzzled when I say that, but um, this is a, a diagram showing the uh, reproductive organs of a typical flowering plant. And you can see, see that the, uh, the female part of, of the flower, which is usually kind of in the middle of the flower, is called the pistil. Uh, different spelling than, you know, not, not, not a pew, pew, not that kind of pistol. Uh, and in, in, inside the pistol, there's a, uh, an organ called an ovary and uh, it produces uh, eggs just, just like in animals. And then there's male reproductive parts called stamens and their job is to release pollen. And, and so this is showing you know, pollen can travel back and forth from, from one flower to another. But when pollen from the male reproductive part lands on the, the pistil. Uh, eventually sperm is deposited and that sperm fertilizes eggs to produce an embryo and which is, becomes a seed in, in plants. And so uh, it's sexual reproduction um, and that uh, increases genetic diversity. Um, the third characteristic that all living organisms share in common is that they can grow and develop. And if we're talking specifically about a multicellular organism like a plant or an animal, growth always takes place the same way. It's a process called mitosis or mitotic cell division. And basically that's where every cell in the body, every cell in the plant, every cell in the animal has the ability to make a copy of all of its DNA and then go through a series of steps where it divides and becomes two cells, genetically identical. And then those cells copy their DNA and they divide again to make four cells and then eight cells and then 16 and 32 and 64 and so forth. And this has been happening in your body for 15, 16, 17 years, however long you've been alive. And you've gone from one single cell uh, a fertilized egg, a zygote, and you're now up to something like 30 trillion cells. How did you grow? By mitotic cell division. 